Welcome to Momentous. I am Pastor Rebecca Great, the pastor and mission developer for Momentous and the host for our podcast. At Momentous, we believe that God is present with us in each and every single one of our moments. We believe that our stories are connected to God's story and to one another's stories. We believe that this connection and relationship changes our lives and our entire world. Before we begin, I invite you to take a deep breath in, to hold it while you count to three, and then slowly release that breath. During this Reading Between the Lines series, we are focusing on sharing the stories of women in the Bible, Uh, people who are often read as part of scripture readings that we have in worship or in Bible study, but stories that tend to be interpreted as the women being supporting characters to all of the men in the stories. So we're spending the series looking at what we know and what we don't know about their stories, and what implications that might have for us today. Because we might notice ourselves in different places within the stories that we have known well, and we might learn to notice small details about stories that can end up changing the entire interpretation. Stories are important. So we know and hope that by sharing all of these stories that we grow in our faith together and grow in our understanding of God's presence with those who are relegated to being in the footnotes of history. Now this week, we are focusing on the intertwined stories of Queen Vashti and Queen Esther. And in sharing their stories, this is going to include references to both sex trafficking and slavery. So if listening to a story that shares details around those topics is too much, you can skip ahead to the announcements uh, to learn more about some new ways that you can connect with the Momentous community, or you can go back and listen to a previous episode, or you can wait to join us for our next episode. In our last episode, we went through the story of Hannah, whose story appears entirely within the first few chapters of the book of 1 Samuel. In this episode, we are jumping ahead several books and several hundred years to the book of Esther, where we meet both the book's namesake as well as Queen Vashti. In this book, we are now firmly in the Persian Empire under the rule of King Artaxerxes. Now, this whole book starts with the king throwing an enormous and lavish party for all of the leaders and rulers of the neighboring empires and the governors of provinces of this empire, all to show off how rich he was. They spent six full days eating and drinking. And while this party was going on, we find out that Queen Vashti was throwing a similar party for all of the women somewhere else in the palace. And she is introduced to us as Queen Vashti. She already has the title. So on the seventh day, after six full days of drinking and eating, the king sends for Queen Vashti so that she can be proclaimed as queen and be crowned. And she refused. And the king was enraged. So if you're someone who has watched a Disney movie or two, and you know about the scene in Beauty and the Beast, where the beast knocks on Belle's door to invite her to come down for dinner, and she refuses, and he becomes enraged, Like, multiply that times about 20 and then take out all the singing of Be Our Guest. So the king and the other rulers were livid about this. Because if word got out that Queen Vashti had publicly refused the king, then other women would learn that they can tell their husbands no 
as well. They wouldn't have to obey everything asked of them because Queen Vashti told the king no, so they wouldn't have to obey anymore. So all the governors tell the king to issue a decree that the queen is never allowed to enter into his presence and someone else will be chosen as queen. All to preserve the order they had known so that women would not get the idea to defy their husbands. There would be order and the men were in charge. And so it's after this, we don't hear about Queen Vashti anymore. She's like mentioned in the next chapter in the book of Esther to compare how much more the king loved Esther. He loved Esther so much more than he ever loved Queen Vashti. And so we don't ever learn anything about Queen Vashti's origin story and how she became queen to begin with. And we don't know how long she had been queen. We don't learn what happens to her after she leaves the story. And we don't know really and truly her reason for telling the king no to the appearance. Now, there are several Midrash or Jewish commentaries uh, on this book, the book of Esther, that say that Queen Vashti would have been summoned to appear in front of the king and anyone else present in the room fully naked as an object for them to look at during their seventh day of partying. In this light, her consent didn't matter. Because when she exercised it, it was met with rage and new decrees making it even harder for women to have their own voice and opinions within this empire. Well, after this, some, some amount of time passes. Like long enough for the king to not be fully enraged anymore. And long enough for some of the king's servants to make a suggestion to bring other young girls to the palace so that the king could choose a new queen. And it's very likely that this group would have been made of girls aged 10 to 15 years old. And I understand that there are cultural differences between our current culture and the typical marriage practices at this time, but I want to make sure that we are clear that this would have been a group of children brought before the king, not a group of adult women being brought before the king. Now, this group was to be entrusted to the care of some of the king's servants so that they could go through like this entire makeover process before they were presented to the king so he could make his choice. So within this group was a woman or a girl named Esther, who was under the care of her cousin Mordecai. And both Esther and Mordecai were Jewish, living in the midst of the Persian Empire. So Mordecai ordered Esther to not let anyone find out that she was Jewish while she was at the king's residence for this whole year-long process. So at the end of this year, one by one, the girls are brought to the king at night and then sent to a second harem the following morning where they wait to find out if the king wants to see her again. So these young girls are brought to the king at night and they don't leave until the next morning. So if you're listening closely, it's really clear that to our modern ears, this is describing sex trafficking, a practice that is still widespread today. And I've included a link to a blog article from the Shiloh Project. If you are curious and you want to and are able to read more about this interpretation. So it's during this process that the king gives Esther the crown and she becomes queen. And then there's this enormous seven day long feast that is thrown to celebrate their new queen. So at this point, Esther still has not disclosed that she was Jewish, but in the midst of this whole past year, she's continued to observe her faith. 
her cousin Mordecai overhears about a plot to kill the king. He tells now Queen Esther about it. It's found out to be true. And Mordecai is then promoted because of his honesty and protection of the king. So eventually, there's another man named Haman who is promoted and requires all of the other leaders or all the other people really in the court to do obeisance, to either bow down or pay some fee or something. And that included Mordecai, who was now a part of the court. Mordecai refused because he was Jewish. He would only bow down to God and not to anyone else. So Haman is enraged, and he then pledges to kill all of the members of the Jewish faith within the Persian Empire. So to do this, Haman approaches the king that there is a nation within this empire that is working to subvert his power and influence, and therefore subverting the power and the influence of the king as well. So Haman presents the king with a written decree against the Jewish people, and the king signs it, telling Haman to do whatever he wanted to do to them. So Haman sent out couriers to every province with orders of what day and at what time they were going to attack. Mordecai learns about this, and he goes into a period of mourning. And he gets word to Queen Esther about what is going to happen to their people. So she orders a fast for all of her people, and she promises to appear before the king, even if that means she will die. She appears and then invites the king and Haman to a feast that she has prepared for them. And the king says, yes, of course, wife, I will go to this feast you have prepared. So then we have this scene jump, and Haman sees Mordecai in his grief, and he becomes enraged and plots to have Mordecai hanged. And then we jump back to another scene where the king is having trouble sleeping. So he has some of his servants just like start reading about this like royal record of events, and he realizes that Mordecai was never formally honored for stopping that assassination attempt from a few chapters earlier. So the king orders Haman to be the one to do the public honoring of Mordecai, and Haman is humiliated. And it's after this that Haman's wife gives him a warning that he is not going to be victorious over Mordecai. So then the scene changes. And we are at the feast that Esther has prepared for the king and for Haman. And it's during this feast that Esther petitions for the lives and the safety of her and her people. And also names Haman as the person who wants to kill all of them. So the king storms out and he is enraged. And Haman stays behind and begins to beg Esther for his life. And while the king is out stomping around, he notices that there are brand new gallows that have been built, the ones that Haman had prepared for Mordecai's death. And the king then orders that Haman be hanged to prevent the destruction of Queen Esther and all of her people. So after Haman's death, Mordecai receives Haman's signet ring and is elevated to Haman's previous position. And Esther makes one final plea, one final plea to the king to issue a decree that revokes all of the orders that Haman had distributed because the couriers are already like they have already gone out and all of the governors of the provinces are just waiting for the day and the time. So the king does, in fact, issue a new decree and the decree goes out and it makes it to all of the provinces in time. But even then, there were still thousands of people that were killed as the result of the revoked decree. And the Jewish people held a festival called Purim, where they celebrated how God saved them from destruction. 
because the people who were killed after the decree went out were those in power within the Persian Empire, not the Jewish people. And that is where our access to the recorded story of Queen Esther ends. Now, in sharing these stories together, it highlights several different things, a few of which I want to lift up. Um, It highlights the necessity of consent in relationships and the importance of voices from the margins having access to individuals in power. It highlights the reality of treating humans as resources and commodities being a practice that still continues today. It highlights the power of using your influence to advocate for marginalized people. And it highlights the importance of honesty and truth-telling in the face of abuses of power. This is not a story of two very meek and timid women who were pushed to the side. Because in this book, they are lifted up for their uses of power. One that is met with hostility and one that is met with acceptance. Now, if you spent your childhood during the 90s, you might have visions of like the Veggie Tales version of the story, which is told completely age appropriately because some of the details that I've highlighted in this episode should not appear in the Veggie Tales version. But this is one of the examples of how we have so much more to learn about the stories that are within the Bible from what we learn in Sunday school as children. Because the Bible is a collection of books, mostly about grown-ups doing grown-up things and behaving in very grown-up ways. There are themes that are still prevalent in our world today, which means these ancient stories are still relevant, helping to guide us in how we interact with and treat one another. A prayer for finding our story in Vashti's and Esther's story. God of the oppressed. There are so many people fighting for power every day. Leaders want more money and more resources and more land and more influence and just more ability to boss people around. Point us to where we can use our power, our voices, to create spaces for people without power to have their voices heard. Fill us with your spirit's presence and guide us to live together as you intended, loving, caring for, and serving our neighbors. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our weekly moment to us. We are looking forward to growing with each of you and are so grateful you are a part of the Momentous community. I want to say thank you to our mission partners, the Southern Ohio Synod and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, as well as our partner congregations throughout the Southern Ohio Synod and the ELCA. Their financial contributions and support and prayers have been instrumental in growing the momentous community. Also this week, I want to thank Faith Lutheran Church in Whitehall. They have called me to preach and lead worship with them this morning, Sunday, October 20th. They do not live stream their worship services but they are active on social media, so you can check out their ministries later today. 
inviting me to supply preach or to lead an education event or a retreat or just to be present with you for worship and answer questions are different ways that congregations and ministries can partner with Momentus. Now, this past week, we officially launched our weekly newsletter. This will have information about upcoming events and sneak peeks of the upcoming podcast episode and a spiritual practice for the month to help you grow in your faith in between episodes. If you would like to sign up, there is a link on our social media pages, and I've included a link to sign up in the transcript uh, for this episode on our website. And speaking of upcoming events, this coming Thursday night, October 24th, 2024, we are going to meet for worship at 7 p.m. at the Maple Shelter at the Allen Creek State Park below Dam Recreation Area. The shelter has plenty of seating and all you need to do is bring yourselves. We will have all of the worship materials for you ready to go. Our next Brood Theology Gathering will be this coming Sunday, October 27th, 2024 at the Olentangy River Brewing Company at 8 p.m. We are going to talk about current events and how we are called to respond as people of faith. There is even more information about future events for later this fall and for office hours and for pulpit supply dates on our website calendar. We would love for you to join us and for you to invite friends to join you. If you would like to support the Ministry of Momentous, attending our in-person events is one way you can do that. Engaging with us online on social media is another. If you're able to give financially, you can visit our website and find more information about how to donate electronically or by mailing checks to our Synod Secure P.O. Box. Each one-time or recurring gift combines together to ensure the momentous community continues to grow. Until our next podcast, remember to breathe deeply and that God is present with you every single moment.